Hello and welcome to Backyard, my YouTube channel, where I bring you with me on my backyard journey, which has, on YouTube, been about 10 years. Thank you to all 30,400 of you viewers. I appreciate it greatly. I always enjoy these Sunday coffee chat. Well, this morning it's more of an energy drink chat, but I always enjoy these get-togethers, giving you an update on what's going on here. And the subject of today's live stream is looking at the question, is chop and drop really worth it? And as you walk around my yard, you'll see now many examples of chop and drop. I export very little in terms of waste. And, uh, you know, it just looks like a debris pile, basically, <laughs> everywhere you look. And I'll jump right to the answer to the question. Yes, it's worth it. And I think it's very gratifying. We almost walked into a spider web. Very gratifying practice to simply see the natural process happening. For many reasons, of course, I love to look at the philosophical side of things as well, the existential, let's say, truths that this may point towards, which is that the processes afoot here are very simple and natural. And I don't mean that it lacks comple complexity. What I mean is that it doesn't take a lot of intervention. Well, that time I did walk into the spider web. I've started a new area of chop and drop and one of the things I like to do now is to put as thick a layer of initial material as I can and I even put in there somewhat large mango branches I love to see how those just simply break down these mango branches not much more than a month old and with the rain we get you can see the fungus is already starting to establish everything just turns back into soil but the thicker the level you can put on there I found the better the faster the process is Oh, look at these sweet little hens. You know, having backyard hens is great. Hello, girls. What are you up to? You've had your morning scratch grains. Picking around for some bugs. These hens have an incredibly large area for the quantity of hens that we have. And sometimes, this time of the day, they get a little chatty. Ooh. Yeah, that's Sally, the, the hen that just got pecked. Sal, Sal is lowest on the pecking order. Therefore, she only gets to eat last after all the other hens have done whatever they want. And sometimes, we found a lot that Sal will find places where bugs are, and then the other hens will come over and just bully her off the ground. <laughs> These little golden sex links are much more aggressive with each other than the hard rocks, but they are so sweet. They love to be held. I think they prefer people to the flock, to be honest. They're beautiful little birds, very fluffy, almost a bantam level bird, which is chicken talk for small bird. Hey James Tropicals, thank you for jumping on the stream. I appreciate it. Always good to see you. You can see Ponzi the chicken here is looking a little raggedy. That's because she is molting. She's losing her feathers. This is uh, a somewhat bug free zone back here due to the hens removing every bug that they could possibly find. They work at it very hard. And in their, in their little caged area here, or large for them, but 
doesn't take up much of my backyard, it's just a corner of it. And I have a somewhat small backyard. But I've been constantly, constantly putting every bit of yard waste I can get back there into this chicken area and they just turn it back into soil in no time. They just scratch and scratch and scratch. And I think it creates a little bit of shelter for bugs to survive in, for worms to survive in. So it makes it a little harder because they'll just efficiently go through and debug every area they can get to. But all of those leaves you see there are sea grape leaves. And the rather large sea grape, which is right here, growing uh, next to this tree fort. And I hadn't, paid too much attention to it, realized it was almost touching the power lines to the east, so I had to remove that. There were some rather large branches, actually, that I did remove, but all of it, 100% of it, has gone back into the chicken pen. And uh, it's already starting to break down a little bit. Of course, if you're doing chop and drop, you, you end up getting favorite types of things to chop and drop. The sea grape is one of the least hospitable chop and drop selections just because the, the leaves are pretty rigid. But I found the chickens have no problem breaking them down once they get a little dry. Oh, really? I just sent my daughter back to school with uh, about two dozen eggs. These little hensies are producing one egg per hen per day, roughly. They slow down a little bit in the summer. Sometimes they'll skip a day. But now that it's starting to cool off just a little bit, by cool off, I mean it's not 100 degrees every day. I believe their egg production will jump up again. We end up giving most of the eggs away, which is a great joy as well. And a great luxury if you can do it. Oh, I don't know if you saw that squirrel. That squirrel. Yeah, right in the frame right there. That squirrel is so, such a tame squirrel in the sense that it'll come down within a foot of you. Almost one. I was wondering if it had rabies. It was acting so forward, but I just think it has absolutely no fear. The moment ends. Good to see you. The moment ends says, such an abundance of sea grapes along the shoreline. That is absolutely the truth. Although they'll grow in it, I think, anywhere that there's sandy soil. They do like that loose soil, though. This particular sea grape, since you mentioned it, uh, it's a pretty good example of what they can do. I've trimmed this a fair amount, enough to keep it in a tree form, but I've got a multi-trunk thing, but you really can tree form them to be a nice tree, but they want to be a gigantic bush, like the, what they do on the, on the dunes. And uh, that's actually a really cool effect, but they can just dominate a whole space. And I'll tell you an example of something that has just dominated the space in my backyard, which I cannot have. A trimmed soon enough, I'm just waiting, is this gigantic Hayden mango tree. Hayden mango trees will get like 60 feet tall. And uh, this one wants to be, but I can't let it. So we've got to reduce it. It's going to open up a lot of possibilities for the backyard. I'm really looking forward to it. And it will be so much, so much quantity of, cho of chopped leaves, etc., that I will not be able to chop and drop most of it. I'll probably just have them haul most of it away. Although, you know, the as I say that, I, I almost feel guilty doing it. I can actually save myself money, too, by not having them haul it off. I don't know. It's just so much. It is so much. If you look at the recent video I posted well, recently within the last month of the flyover of the backyard, you can see that this thing is just, majority of the yard is this mango tree. Now it produces a healthy quantity of Hayden mangoes, which is nothing to be scoffed at. That is a great mango variety. They taste so good. 
a little bit of fiber in them, you know. If you're not a fiber-loving mango person, there are definitely camps in the mango aficionado world. Let's just take a moment and check out this. Hopefully this is coming through well on the camera, but just the blue and green scenario. Two of my favorite colors, without any doubt. And it's not always super green around here. Uh, this area, I live on a barrier island, and it, it's, it's an arid environment. The original vegetation, which was here prior to people I mean, turning it into neighborhoods, was very low scrub brush, um, low scrub palm, sable, probably an occasional uh, hammock, small coastal hammock type situation, but very small. Some slash pines towards the Indian River Lagoon, but really not that much here in terms of, you know, a non-coastal thing. You would never imagine, is what I'm getting to, you would never imagine that you could have something like this growing here. This is a freak show for this environment. And of course, the key ingredient, the thing which that the natural environment did not have here is water. And if I look at what I'm doing here, really that's the key thing that I fill the gaps in. We do get a lot of water. We get heavy afternoon storms a lot of times, but we'll have long periods of time where we don't have rain. And basically all this stuff would, most of it would die very young. Once it's established, a lot of these things will do quite well in dry conditions, but they would never get through that initial stage because they would get a major drought and just get destroyed. So filling in the gaps of water is really the main role that I do here. And also then adding the nutrients. And of course the chop and drop getting back to the theme is part of that approach, which is to not allow those nutrients to escape this backyard environment because they have value. Put them right back in. Yeah, we've been stoked. The moment end says lots of water this past week. Yeah, absolutely. I love it when it rains. A part of it is I love it when it rains because after the rain comes the potential evening glass off in the surf, which is always nice to get out there for a surf session with the offshore winds. A lot of times, uh, we're on the east coast of Florida, a lot of times as the systems push through on the back end, we get a westerly wind. It'll be easterly in the afternoons. The dream scenario is westerly in the morning, easterly throughout the afternoon, and then the storms push through with enough time for a few hours of westerly winds in the evening, which is nice. And I'll tell you what, I got so sunburned last week. I try to really avoid that. I wear you know, long sleeve rash guards and all that out, and some, but got just so much sun. Even the zinc and everything wasn't working for me. But when it does, I always say in Florida, it's it feels sunny when it's raining. <laughs> and even when it's even when it's dark purple cloud on the horizon, you know, big storms overhead, it just always just still seems bright to me. I don't know, something I I love it, but it's such a relief to be able to have the sun just lay off and everything to cool down. Mm, I love it. Maybe we get our seasons in the period of a day. That would be a good way to look at it because I feel like the seasonal cycle, especially in the summer in Florida, is daily. You go through a season every day. So morning, afternoon, evening, nighttime. Oh, look at this thing. Diversifying my fig collection. Happy to say, I want more types of figs to eat. To eat, I love the figs. And I'll show you a quick comparison here while we're talking about figs of what the difference is. Now, this is a Janeri which produces a rather large fig at a local nursery. And it had a slow start, as I often say, fig trees, they're a lot of root. They're ficus, derivative, and you should allow for them to establish roots and then jump a bit. And this one went through the jump, which I, what I mean by jump is you'll see a longer growth in the branch. It'll all of a sudden do a, I don't know, a foot and a half, 
two foot long growth cycle in a branch as opposed to prior when it's setting up roots they'll just produce little little sprouts maybe a couple inches three inches and then that'll be it and it when it produces that initial burst of growth i'm always very encouraged so this one is doing it that's the generi uh, i'm going to point out a couple things here because growing figs can be a little bit challenging in this environment uh, one of the things that happens a lot is they, they get what we call rust which is where the leaves get this black spot on it uh, this one has it but it's not too bad and oh man i'll tell you the fragrance i wish we had smell o vision the fragrance of this jamaican cherry tree is so intense it's like a sweet it smells almost like a cotton candy machine uh next to you it, it's great smell and the leaves on these are actually sticky a little bit i don't know if i can you know, if you can really see it but they, it's it's sticky definitely on the bottom if you run your finger along the bottom you can feel a, a stickiness that's on there which has, <clears throat> has that smell anyway distracted for just a moment but the generic okay and it okay figs also drop their leaves they're deciduous now once the leaves get that rust on them they tend to fall off and that happens quite a bit I have a another fig tree here which is the brown turkey fig which has been here for years and you can see this one is looking very different it's got the rust on the leaves big time well this is the end of the cycle anyway we're not going to get any more fruit now so that's why this never bothers me i don't treat them for the rust but it's going started to drop its leaves unlike the generi showing no no signs of leaf droppage it will soon but you can see much more of that rust in the leaves if you want to treat it i think people put type of copper spray on it typically and uh that would be the way to go. I don't just because I don't really feel like it affects production too much. And this is my secret to taste figs. Penelope the rabbit up with Thumper. This is Penelope's turn down in the bunny run. This time of year, this time of day. She's feeling sleepy. She likes this spot, but what we love about having rabbits and why they're so key to this system is that they produce super, super high quality bunny manure, which you cannot beat bunny manure for the nutrients and everything in my yard gets a diet of bunny manure thanks to these little rabbits that we have. These are rather small rabbits. Um, when we get our next rabbits, when these rabbits end, they live for about four years, I think, maybe a little longer. No, actually, I think a rabbit lives for like five to seven years. So that's what I read. But regardless, that's a, that's a long life for a rabbit if you think about it. The next rabbits I get will be slightly larger, just so the production of the Manure is the even higher, a higher level. The everyday life of OCD's chick. Hey, hey, friend. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for jumping on the stream. Great to see you always. I gotta go over and check out your channel here. Get the update on what you've got growing. Now, up up there in the north northern lands, you are shutting down for winter, I suppose. This is really when our vegetable season begins is uh this time of year this is when growing vegetables growing more tender leafed things become possible and uh, i've started some of that i can give you a quick update i also planted an olive tree and uh because apparently olive trees are delicious as soon as i planted it back here penelope ran up and chewed a, a bud off of it off new growth and i thought oh yeah rabbits like the taste of olive trees so we're gonna have to put a little protective barrier around so that it doesn't get eaten but it's been doing pretty well decided to put mulch in here which has been a good move chickens got in the other day and of course they tear up everything so it's 
a little bit modified by the chickens. It makes me not want to have the chickens back here too much, but I, I, we always get the impression Penelope enjoys having the chickens around. Oh, you grow, oh wow, okay. Yeah, everyday life of OCD chick says that she is in Maryland and uh, I've already started my fall garden. Grow 365, baby. Yeah, that's cool. Well, yeah, why let that stop you? You must have a greenhouse. Yes, I do have a rabbit. I have two rabbits. That's Penelope and she's the female rabbit. Oh yeah. It is the finest. Rabbit poop is a great fer fertilizer. I totally agree with you. I don't think there is anything better. Probably things as good. I've heard guinea pig poop is good, um, but you can't compare it to something like horse manure and cow manure, which are far below the specs of the bunny manure. Chicken manure is good. These little chickens, but uh, I don't know. I think the process of changing it into usable fertilizer is kind of complicated because you have to compost it. And that's the beautiful thing of the bunny manure. You can just put a direct, direct apply onto your vegetables. You don't have to worry about the same kind of things you would with the chickens. It's bunnies being vegetarians. But uh, we do use the, the bedding from their coop, clean that out, and uh, on a regular basis, just wood shavings. This is my little compost area. Com I really need to organize this. But the time of organization is approaching because it is now when it will be tolerable to, to work on this area. And to be honest, I kind of like it just like this. various projects. We've got some frangipani. Those are plumeria cuttings. Uh, I've got some longevity spinach here, which I've been growing. And here's the chicken bedding, which this time we just dumped it out here. Uh, not That is one definite way to go. It's just another form of chop and drop, but I've been typically putting it into these two compost bins. You can see the mango tree. This compost bin is becoming a mango tree pot. So I've got to really take this seriously and get this thing out of here. But the mango tree is looking very healthy growing in the compost. Contained chop and drop, let's say. You can see we've got chocolate pudding fruit in there. And that's because the chocolate pudding fruit tree has been dropping some of the fruit. That's not a bad thing. It's just that it gets windy. And there's plenty left. Holy moly. It's about time to pick some chocolate pudding fruit. If you have not had a chocolate pudding fruit, should look for an opportunity to achieve that. They're not super sweet, but they're definitely fun to eat. It's more of an avocado-ish vibe to it, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, so the, the bedding, a lot of it being produced all the time. And these compost bins have no problem eating it up. No matter how much compost I put in there, it seems like it continues to stay to uh, go down. The level goes down. It's like it's being eaten from the bottom up by all the the worms. I'm going to actually make a video on transforming this area, but one of the things I'm going to do is to flip compost bins. Now I haven't done that. I actually have a pitchfork to do it with, and done it. One of the things will be to remove this large mang. Which, by the way, what I'm going to do with the mango tree is graft on a better mango variety onto this seed stock. Uh, I have another one over on the side here that I'm growing in a pot from a year ago for that same purpose. Let me get big enough. The uh, size of a couple pencils, maybe, or at least a bigger than a pencil width to the trunk, I will graft on a branch. And then you get a strong rootstock that can grow in this with the strong stock at the top. Business down below, party up top. Now, this area, I, I've got to say one of the drawbacks of the chop and drop is it just looks 
kind of ratty. Just looks like debris heaps. You know, and I do like structure and order, so that did bother me a little bit. And it's like an exercise in relaxing about that a little bit and not being overboard with it. So there's a place for that, I suppose, you know. Of course, where you have things orderly and looking great. But I think back here in the backyard, this is a private enough area and it uh, is to me a very beautiful thing to behold that just as I've changed my perspective slightly. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about the chop and drop is that the fungus effect. If you can see, we've got some white mushrooms growing up right out of right out of the wood that I that I left there. That's exactly what you want to see, in my opinion. In my humble opinion, that is exactly what you want to see. Look at this, another type of mushroom. Very interesting, you know, it's growing right, this wood has not been here for that long. So I'm just attempting to express the point that this is a very easy process, basically. And here, here's another type of, like a lichen. Fungus is among us. It's undeniable, it's everywhere. You know what the, the chop and drop process basically is? Just throw stuff on the ground. That's really it. Some other drawbacks you might think of as well. You know, doesn't this create places where critters can make nests and all that? And, you know, I don't know, like rats or some undesirable creature. Uh, and sure, yeah, it does. So you gotta manage that part, I suppose. But I haven't had any problems with that at all, not yet. We had some possums definitely that were back in there. They actually took a, took a shot at eating the chickens unsuccessfully. Chickens rallied against the possum and nearly pecked it to death. But uh, you know, they'd, they'd be no match for a pro any lightweight raccoon. But the point is, yeah, it, the, the vermin issue has not been significant at all for me and if you look at this let me show you something here look at this this leaf <laughs> is that a problem is that a problem i don't think it is i don't think it's a problem at all i think it's just the natural thing happening i think the problem would be if this were the only branch but look Lots of other branches doing just fine and let all the leaves drop off. They'll all grow back. This particular spot has got a rich nutrient flow to it all the time. You know, I'm going to try this longe longevity spinach. Give that a try. Oh, I hate to take a leaf off just because it's starting to grow, but that's not spirit. That's this. <laughs> there it is. Longevity spinach. I really, this year, I really want to get into what my uh, buddy calls salad trees. More to come on that. But the various tree like, shrub like things where you can eat the leaves. And this is a theme I'm going to start to really drill down into much more, which is the fruit is one thing, and it's great. I love the fruit. But the veg, that is also great. And although I will eat it, we'll try this here in a minute in the proper eat your backyard tradition, uh, my animals will also eat it. And so it becomes a useful cog in the machine that is the backyard, that is the backyard system, where now I'm feeding my chickens grass from a little grass area where I just let the natural grasses grow high and I feed them natural grass every day and they love it it's a great part of their diet eat those eggs bam get the benefit back but everything I would love those creatures are gonna love some of the things the rabbits love all it's almost all the things that the hen they'll eat just about anything but let's give this a try longevity spinach it's, 
that's really good. I can say it almost has like a, a parsley, a very, very slight parsley essence to it, but I almost hate to disturb the hens in their solitude, but why not? Let's see if my hens are properly trained. Yeah, chick, chick. Look at that. They always come when called. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Okay, so you finished the leftover spaghetti. Yeah, all of our, all of our excess. Oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Now they've got something to fight over. All of our excess food, leftovers, anything we would have thrown away, <laughs> these little hens love. I, I tell my wife that the, the chickens have formed a religion and she, she is their god because they, especially with her, they just lose their mind. They get like nervous in a frenzy when they see her because she feeds them so many treats. And, you know, just her personality. <laughs> Look at this. What the heck is that, you say? I'm gonna smell this. Actually, it has a kind of a pleasant smell. That is the flower of a male papaya plant. That's the leaf. How do you know it's a male papaya plant? Let's see, will a chicken eat a papaya flower? It's probably something. You, yeah. <laughs> I lose my mind when people feed me treats. Yeah, exactly. You know, all of my favorite people in my life have fed me treats. Here you are. Oh. Uh, taste any good? The chicken won't eat it. Oh, yeah. Why don't you try it? You want it? I'm not going back for seconds. No. The chicken knows. Instinctively knows. One of the questions I had when I was getting chickens was, what if they eat something poisonous? It's like, well, chickens basically, it looks like they eat everything they encounter. Like they'll eat, they eat a snake. They eat all kinds of things. I, they'll eat any lizard that hits the ground here is, is dead on arrival. If these hens can get it, a hold of it. They uh, voraciously consume anything they can. But you see how they, they took that papaya flower. Nah, not really interested. Whatever it is about it. And sometimes they'll pick a thing up and, and they just, if you watch, it's so fast you can hardly see it. They'll pick it up and they just let it go. They immediately dispel it. Is that a word? Dispel? Uh, they drop it. Spit it out. But yeah, the, the male papaya, you can tell that it's a male papaya because of this simple secret. The long the long stalk with the multiple flowers. Now, the female papaya will also have the multiple flowers, like it'll have this kind of thing, but it doesn't go out on the stalk. And more typically, it's just one or two flowers. Some varieties, it's almost always just one. But uh, yeah, now, why do you care? Well, because the males don't produce fruit. And the males also produce, produce, uh, you know, pollinate the fruit to make more seeds. They produce the seeds in the female fruit. So theory is if you didn't want a lot of seeds, you wouldn't have the males around or they have no use because they don't produce fruit. And so typically they're kind of not looked upon favorably, but I think they're awesome. And here's the other thing is how much papaya can you eat? You know, I mean, if you start having some papaya trees in your yard and where I live and take care of them, feed them bunny turds as every good papaya tree owner should, you're gonna have this, which are giant Hawaiian papayas, all loaded with fruit. I don't know if you can see very well, but maybe I'll try to zoom in. I feel like the David Attenborough of, uh, mang of papaya. But that's a lot. And if we look on this one behind it, 
Oops, I'm not really getting a good shot of that. There are a lot on that as well. Okay, now, one problem here certainly is that thing is easily 30 feet up in the air. Now, at 25, I would say no worries. That fruit's just, it's just a matter of time. It's coming down. I climb that, climb up that thing. However, now as I mature, I realize that's right up there next to those 220 power lines. And if I fall down, I'll probably be in the hospital. So it's almost unusable fruit. And that's what it's become now is it's just a gigantic tree. And I love it though. I love the look of it. Thanks OCDS chick. Yeah, I agree. It's so beautiful, especially against the blue sky. I mean, that blueness, whew, I just, it's uh, breathtaking to me. My favorite, favorite frequency of light. But you know, they're dropping down and the chickens are eating it, which is great. So I don't, I don't go out for the high altitude fruit anymore. You can multi-trunk it, and that, that's something I've learned too, which is that probably better when it's younger to top it off and not let it get that big. Here's another one. Looks like it's, storms are almost starting to roll in. By the way, we are excited today, excited to watch some NFL football. It's going to be Jack and I watching the game. We're almost thinking we might go to a local sports bar that we love that has good seafood to watch the Bucks game. The Buccaneers are playing the Saints, which has the Buccaneers' old quarterback. <laughs> and uh, Jameis Winston, who was on, on the Buccaneers for many years and is having a good season this year so far, one game in. Of course, he threw a lot of interceptions when he played for the Bucs, so I'm not a fan. But we have got an amazing team. The Saints always have an amazing team. I think they've beaten the Buccaneers the last seven game times they've played the Bucs, which is, uh, Tom Brady said, that's not a rivalry because you can't have a rival rivalry with somebody that's beaten you seven times in a row. You have to win once in a while for it to be a rivalry. So that would be an exciting game today. Love the underdog experience. Of course, you know, we've got all these amazing players, so you know, I feel like an underdog. Anyway, so we're gonna go do that. And meanwhile, my wife and youngest daughter are out looking for dresses for upcoming event. Yeah, the Saints are very good bet today. <laughs> uh, moments end. You're right. I can't deny it. I can't deny it. I did go see a Buccaneers Saints game in Tampa years ago as we come up to the Moringa tree. Uh oh, and walked directly into that spider web. But uh, that was one of the greatest football experiences of my life, without any doubt. We went and tailgated there, and it, you know, tailgating it at Buccaneers Stadium is just so fun. It's such a kind of just cool place to be. The vibes always seem to be really good. And we were amongst lots of Saints fans and there was a cool kind of atmosphere. And we ended up getting uh, this uh, group that was next to us. The couple of women gave us cookie cake. <laughs> Saints cookie cake. We ate the cake. We beat the Saints that day. We beat the Saints that day. That was a great day. They kept saying, the breeze is in the air. The breeze is in the air. Drew Brees. And who dat, of course. All right, let's look here real quick. See if we can find a cherry. Get my vitamins today. By the way, anybody, have you heard of that stuff? Um, I'm try, this is a Jamaican cherry, by the way. The flavor of these has increased, I mean, has become much more kind of distinctive, I would say, <clears throat> recently as a result of using the, the bunny manure. This is the chicken's favorite. They see me picking it and they're just starting to go berserk. That one's kind of rotten. It's almost torture for them to see me picking it.
that was wonderful. You know, to fill in the gaps, I've planted many things which grow pretty much year-round fruit. And this is one good example of it. Oh, look what we have here. Ah, you see that? See all those holes in the leaves? Oops, oh, fell off. Little white beetle. Notorious little bug. Chews up all the leaves. Which also make great chicken treats. Which is why I was gonna grab one. You couldn't possibly win a war against those leaf-eating bugs. They are just on everything. But they, you know, they don't actually, I don't think hurt much. All right, here we are. Let's see what they'll, I was wrong. Oh, they're watching. Oh yeah. All right, Henzos. Oh, you might notice vacancy here. That That is my worm farm location, but I finally got rid of it because it was also an excellent mosquito larvae growing area. So I'm gonna back off on the worm farm thing a bit until I figure that out. But I found my yard is basically worm farm now. As you drop those bunny turds down, that's what the worms are looking for. Oh, do you know what that is? Uh -huh. You ever seen one of those? Are you for? Oh, are you familiar with the cotton candy fruit? It's like fastest. You ever? You ever see that game Rock'em Sock'em Robots? You got it. Okay, top hen. If you're really brave, you hand feed it to them. <laughs> well done. That'd probably look pretty cool in slow mo. I mean, oh, yeah, got the peck. Yeah, thank you, OCDS chick. The variety of stuff. I keep. Excuse me, sorry, I should have muted. Uh, I keep adding things. I'll show you something I added recently. Now, last year, a lot of the things I added were things like Moringa, and Roselli, and so on and so forth, Pigeon Pea. And here's another Moringa. You like this, uh, this is just a giant oak limb that I set with a post hole digger to hold up this, this Moringa, but we've got Moringa growing all over the place now. Yeah, let's go take a look at this little corner. I'll just show you this this area. I'm, I'm actually got a video concept I'm gonna eventually put together, which is to show. All, I have all the before video of this corner here. This, well, this south facing south side of my yard and east corner was basically just barren nothing at all and most everything that we that we see here is a result of either cuttings or seeds but really none of it was brought in other than a few of the decorative crotons on cuttings and you can see my pineapple growers just going off the deep end right now all right so june plum this is another one that has an excellent edible leaf you know in addition to the fruit what can you get? Oh, there's a little lizard. Just jumped on my hand. Excellent leaves. Very tangy. Would be like, this would be something you could put in a salad. I could see like having romaine or something like that, even like iceberg lettuce and, and chopping some of this up to put in to give it a little bit of zing, a little zest. Really good. I'm gonna try it. Mmm. I do like that. You know, I haven't, I haven't ever fed this to the chickens. I'm gonna take one off the bottom see what they like this but that's a new one june plum now this is one i'd failed at growing before but 
when I went down to uh, Reed Farm, I couldn't resist it. He basically told me, listen, I, I want to show you your next fruit tree. All right, yeah, that's a pretty convincing sales pitch. But once I tried the leaf, I couldn't resist another go at it. And it's doing quite well. Of course, if that thing starts to get, if that thing starts to get uh, salt on the leaves, it's not gonna do well, but it's already fruiting. Feeling very good about that. Most of the other stuff you see here is are things that I already had, but I am giving it a go with the key lime. And the key lime has already got some little limes on it, oddly enough. Really, really a big producer, if you know anything about key limes. I've never grown one on my property. I have friends that have them though. And uh, they claim the key is to plant them when they're young. So they're the kind of plant you want to establish as a young plant. So maybe going and finding the huge potted key lime that costs hundreds of dollars is not the way to go. And besides the fact that one of the chickens did get out and came over here and mistakenly just broke a branch off of it, which is like, oh man. But it's established. So there's another new one, the June plum, the key lime. The Barbados cherry, we have many of these. They're wonderful, but uh, this was just a, I don't know, it was really an impulse buy. <laughs> I couldn't resist a, a $12 Barbados cherry tree. I was like, I could find somewhere to stick that. Now these, these uh, ever-bearing mulberry trees are champions, without a doubt. You can see this one has grown on a cutting and it's already trying to throw fruit out. Many videos on the channel about it, but this is now a reliable, reliable crop for the chickens as well. It's one of the reasons that I've decided to plant so many. Oh, this one's got a interesting, some kind of critter made a nest inside there. Trying to look to see what's in there. Probably a worm. Sometimes when you find, it's like finding a, an extra treat for those chickens because they will love that bug. Especially if you find a little leaf worm roaming around. That's practically one of their favorite things. All right, let's see what they like. The chickens know. So we've seen them turn their nose up at papaya flower. Eager participants. No need to, uh, you know, convince them with witty argument. You want some ever-bearing mulberry leaves? And there you go. I would claim, don't quote me, not quote me. If a chicken can eat it, whoa, oh man, that was brutal. He's out of frame, but. The low chicken on the totem pole just got tagged. Yeah, so they love it. This is a widely known food crop for animals. Uh, there's actually an elephant farm in central Florida where they feed their uh, elephants mulberry leaves. Now, this is the June plum. Okay, June plum? First June plum they've ever tried. A little zesty. Your thoughts out there. What they do love is that moringa, which is almost like a horseradish. Uh, yeah, I think once they got a taste of it, they decided it was for them. Oh. Yeah. That's the chicken chicken Joe here on the right. Yeah, I'd say they approve. They even picked up the little piece that was on the ground. I'm going to be trying to give you a... I don't really want to take one off of this yet because it's just, just getting started. And it's been all too tempting to over trim this one but i think this moringa tree it's getting to the point where it is okay we're gonna eliminate this spider web once and for all all right yeah i think this one's getting to the point where it is off and off to the races i mean just lots of moringa leaves now if you could eat one of these moringa choke down one of these moringa leaves a day the story is that you will be more healthy I would claim that's probably correct on some level. Many, maybe multiple levels. 
but look at that tree of life man longevity plant people think that this makes them grow to 110 years old you really gotta ask yourself do you want to live to be 110 years old all right here you go i'd like to be as healthy as possible and these chickens would like to eat it all you can tell what they really love and it's pretty obvious <laughs> you can see through there the, the bunny's trying to get in on the action the bunny always sits right over here next to the chicken yeah I'm being told that the game is approaching. We don't have too much more time, but we want to. I think one thing, one more thing I'm going to do is do a bunny swap. It's time to. Now, I could just throw it in there. To me, that makes them over it more for no good reason. And they to have the leverage. Chickens, it seems, are very readily hand fed due to the fact that they eat their food by kind of grabbing onto it and breaking it off they don't chew it so if they don't if the thing just moves away when they grab onto it or when they try to pull, break it off it goes with them it doesn't seem to work very well so you can see why a chicken would love this so hand feeding chickens i'm gonna claim really fun i mean people make whole pastimes out of like feeding pigeons and stuff it's very relaxing there you go okay let's do a bunny swap time to do bunny swap if we can catch i'll put the camera down here you can watch the bunny capture uh -oh, Pen penelope's getting ready to dig a hole let's see if we can get a hold of her in one easy step Unsuccessful bunnies, bunny grab. Say hi. And of course, he's got to sniff all the areas which his sister Penelope has been in. Sometimes when they start doing that, it means they're about ready to start digging a hole. Rabbits dig holes, and I like to give them places they can dig holes, so we don't necessarily try to stop them from doing it ever. Just once they do it, we fill it back up and usually put a brick on top, and that'll take them off the, <laughs> the urge to dig a hole that's 10 feet deep. Is it maybe, maybe what you want to get to? Is that olive tree? Are you trying to get to that olive tree? Look at that, isn't that adorable? To me, a rabbit is a great, great pet. And of course, you know, on the more pragmatic side, rabbits are also a great source of meat. Of course, we don't use these for that purpose, but many countries, Rabbits are a reliable source of protein. This is a lionhead bunny, which is a relative of the, like the 
cashmere bunny, I think, or whatever, the super soft types of bunnies that they use the pelts for furs and all that, so they're incredibly soft. These bunnies will live out their life very peacefully, as very few bunnies in history of the bunnies have ever had that level of luxury. <laughs> So yeah, all right, time to move on to step two of the day. I hope you have something cool planned, even if it's not doing anything. That's kind of cool to do too sometimes. Also, I want to give a quick shout out. I wanted to say thank you to everybody who's watched this stream all the way to the end. That is amazing. Most of the views of these streams come after the event itself. So don't hesitate to leave a comment. Let me know what you think. And if there's anything that helps the general community, we love that. So go do that. Uh, give it a thumbs up if you remember to do that. That helps get the word out a little bit more. Uh, subscribe if you're not already. Also, go check out my original music channel called Jedi Jingle Maker, where I put all my original music. I claim you can really not know me unless you know me through my music. It's something I love to do. It's something I recently decided to launch, and I've got about 50 songs up now, which is pretty cool. I love making them play guitar, keyboard, etc., and produce these things. Would love to see you subscribe over there as well at Jedi Jingle Maker. And uh, check out some of those vids. Let me know what you think. A new video out there every week, in which I also sing in some of those, believe it or not. Believe it or not. All right, oh, this is a good way to end it. Beautiful Suriname cherries. I'm gonna try one of those too. Really good. Super high germination rate with those two. Anywhere you look, you're gonna find little cherry trees growing around here. So have a great day. Thank you for jumping on the stream. Appreciate you. Stay tuned for more videos coming out. Live streams nearly every Sunday. And uh, yeah, thanks. Have a great day.